Hello, true art, art believers. You know what? I already did. I already messed up. It's I'm I'm a little bit out of out of sorts or out of shape, like out of intro intro shape. So I just want to say hello, true art believers. Welcome to today's installment of the artist interview series. Today I will be talking with Tommy Mavra. Tommy is an artist. Before I start, make sure to smash the subscribe button and hit the notifications bell. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Tommy Mavra, how are you doing today, sir? Hello, I'm doing good. I'm doing good, how good. are you? I am doing good. Uh, I always say this, uh, um, uh -huh. but every time I do those intros, there is always like a five second bomb. Like, like a, I just, I mess them up every time. Very at the intro, it's always like just some, I don't know. Uh, maybe I just get really anxious or uh, like, I just get super, super pumped or energetic or, or a little like anxious and nervous all at once, all kind of mixed up into an anxious and nervous ball. <laughs> and then I start fumbling, like fumbling my words. And then I can really, I can physically feel my tongue kind of roll around uh, and words are not doing what words should be doing. They're doing something else completely. And they're like doing the opposite of what should be happening, which is actually doing a proper intro. So I, I apologize for that, well, that stumbling and fumbling uh, uh, through the words thing. Well, now you expect to do it. So you're going to keep doing it. You I know, have, right? You should get like a button or a sound or something. Every time you mess up, you could have a little celebration. Turn it into a positive <laughs> Oh, experience. Yes, like, uh, I could I could turn it into um, ma uh, make it rewarding, right? Yeah. So whenever I do a successful one, I like maybe I have like a, a an M and M. You can have an M and M dispenser. You could have a T shirt cannon, and you shoot a T shirt at yourself. <laughs> I just have like <laughs> like two T shirt uh, T shirt cannons, and I'm just, like, I'm just popping them in the house. <laughs> And it's like every time kids. you make a mistake, it's just free T-shirts for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that that kind of reminds me when we were uh, like, make it. If you're gonna make it like rewarding, I, I I immediately thought of the. There's an episode of The Office at the very beginning. Um, what's it, Dwight Schrute and uh, uh, what's the other character? Do you know the, what I'm talking about? The the there's another character that Dwight Schrute's all like his arch nemesis. But basically, so the art, his arch nemesis, the, the other character whose whose name I just forgot. Um, uh, I know who you're talking about. I can't yeah, remember his name. Either. He's yeah, like the yeah. main guy. He's like one of the main guys. Yeah, he's like yeah. he's always teasing. Te he's always teasing Dwight, and he he did like this little little uh, uh, thing where uh, every time his his timer rang, uh, he'd give Dwight a, a like a mint. <laughs> You know, or ask Dwight for a nice. minute. And eventually, eventually, he he did it so much that Dwight would just put out his hand whenever he heard the bell, and he was like, "What do you want?" I was like, "I don't know why I have my hand out." You know, <laughs> because he's he's been uh, um, built up been that condition. Yeah, he's been conditioned to to like that positive feedback loop. Like <laughs> every time he hears a bell, he gets and receives a a piece of candy. So maybe I should do something like that. And you're right. I there there is some truth to that. Where I I. Uh, I kind of psych myself out and like, it's like, uh, uh, you're manifesting that, that, that outcome. And I need mm -hmm. to think, I need to think long and hard how I can fix that. You know? So, <laughs> Tommy Mavra. <clears throat> yeah. What do you need to know? If you could have any dessert right now, what would it be? Man. I have a dessert upstairs and I didn't want it. You didn't want it? No. It's like a pistachio cream puff. What's a pistachio cream puff? It's like a pistachio cream inside one of those puffy pastry things. Like kind of like a eclair but okay. round and yeah. And it has like it's, it has like a whipped pistachio Yeah, maybe? like a yeah, like a cream type of thing. Does it do you get like bits of pistachio in it or, or is it like a I haven't butter? had it yet. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea. It so, looks delicious. So, uh, uh, but what is your hands down dessert of choice? 
Oh, like a good piece of pie. Almost almost any kind of pie. I like I like them. With the fruit, the nuts, chocolate pecan, all that stuff, man. Pecan uh, pecan pie? Yeah. With what's what's in that it's what's that in that gel that gelatin gelatin gelatin? Do you know? It's like sugar and I think it's a corn syrup and I and some I have no idea. Man. I don't know how do to you, make that. Do you ever make your own pies? I've made pies, but not the, not that one. I've, I've made like sweet potato pie and apple pie. Do you like making uh, pies, or or is it like a? a... No, it's kind of annoying. I like to just I like <laughs> having them. <laughs> <laughs> the only place is like. So I lived in New York for you know a long time. Uh, I, I just recently moved to Philadelphia, but in New York, if you're gonna buy a good pie, it's like seventy dollars, and uh, so I was like, I could just make one. And I can make them pretty good. It's just, it's not my favorite thing to do. Seventy dollars for a good pie in New York? <laughs> yeah, they're like sixty, seventy dollars. Why? It's crazy. Why are they so expensive? I I don't know. I don't know. But anywhere else where they're just they're just not as good, or they're not that good. It's not like worth eating. Like and they don't make the crust good or something. You would you would buy a seventy dollar pie? No, I wouldn't buy it. That's why I would make it. <laughs> like come the holidays, we would just make some pies. So you never, but, you never bought one of those expensive pies from New, in New York. No, no, I'm sure they're. Del- I've heard they were delicious, but not even, not even for a special occasion. No, no, it's crazy. What, what would, <laughs> what would constitute a special occasion for you to, to, for yourself to like reward yourself? a $70 pie like what would you have to do <clears throat> to be like you know what I deserve this $70 pie <laughs> uh, well I don't expect it to be like that great so it's really just a matter of how much uh, like money do I have to just waste because then I wouldn't <laughs> care if I had like more money at the time I'd be like whatever I don't care I'll just buy the pie I don't want to make one but um, and it's in terms of like special occasion I don't know, man. These past two years just made me feel like just celebrate when you got it in you to celebrate because mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just take advantage of that. Like, you know, I don't need like a big occasion. I would eat an $80 pie or a slice of pie for, you know, because the sun came out or because it started raining. That's a good enough occasion. You, we, you could make the argument that just waking up that day could <laughs> constitute a $70 pie. <laughs> Yeah, but if you do that every day, you're not gonna have any more days to wake up to, probably. <laughs> you're, <laughs> From you're, not gonna have, you're not gonna have the bank account left to to. <laughs> you're, you're you're gonna be calling your mom, or or and you're like, and asking for a loan, and and they're like, <laughs> "Why do you need a loan, honey?" Uh, to live I, my I, best life. <laughs> I've, I've blown all of my money, mom, on pies. You have no idea. They're so good. <laughs> I'm celebrating the day. Um, so uh, you would, it, it wouldn't, uh, there would not have to be anything like, so like not even like, oh, I, I sold out an art show or I got into the Guggenheim or I got into, you know, would that be like the thing that you would be like splurge and buy a $70, $80 pie? Nah, no. If I get like some really good news, no, I don't really know. Try just, I'm really I don't, I don't, you know, it, any any reason. Like, if you have the money and you want the pie, I think is a reason enough. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't even like care that much to 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 think about it like that. Like, if I got some really good news, I don't know. I'd like to go for a walk, like in the trees somewhere, just to like balance it with something calm you know yeah what, you, know, you what, get good news and your brain starts firing and you're like all hyped up uh so maybe good to balance that with like some trees <laughs> how, how long did you uh live in new york on and off my whole life like i would move away and then come back and then move away and come back yeah come back to philadelphia or come back somewhere else no new york new york it was always i was born in new york Like I went to school like in different parts of New York. Um, So I've lived all over the city and some of the suburbs. And uh, 
Yeah, but like when I was 18, I moved when when I went to college uh, down in Memphis. Uh, when I finished that, I went to California for a bit. Then I went back to New York and I was living in uh, Brooklyn for a while. Spent some time abroad after that, came back to New York again. So on and off most of my life. What was it like growing up or, or, or um, what was it like living in New York? when <laughs> like, uh, like just, just like, recently because i just moved that i just moved to philly a year ago i've never lived in philly before so i just moved here one year ago uh last september 11th actually um but before that being in new york was it's it's you have to embrace that hustle culture you mm -hmm. know unless you're like you know independently wealthy then you don't really have to do that but you kind of have to just to just to kind of survive and pay all you know your rents and your bills and all that, um, you know. And then on top of that, like you have your life, your personal life. Yeah. You know, so it could get exhausting. It's I like how much do you how much do you have in you? You know, um, it's very congested, so you're always kind of with people, near people. Uh, so it could be a lot. It's good. There's a lot of great things over there. Um, but in recent years, it's becoming more and more like, or less and less affordable, you know? Mm -hmm. So the way New York uh, worked for a while was like, the boroughs were the cheap place to live and Manhattan was kind of expensive. Uh, and then like Queens and Brooklyn was cheap. And then, then those started to get expensive, but you could still find a normal like place to live if you went out further out into those boroughs. Uh, but now everything is just really pricey and uh, it's a little bit crazy. So I kind of got tired, man. What was got like tired what, of doing that? What was rent like uh, before you, you moved? What was the, 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 <laughs> the living like? It wasn't too crazy, but uh, I lived with my wife and we shared an apartment with my brother and his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And it was a pretty big apartment, you know, like multiple bathrooms and plenty of space to separate. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't even remember what we were paying. Like, it was like close to $3,000 total, something like that. So it wasn't like anything. Yeah. It wasn't, that place wasn't anything crazy. Was it three or four? I can't even remember, man. That's pretty cheap uh, for New York, right? Yeah, but we lived at that, that apartment was in a terrible location. Because okay. it was like right next to the uh, Gowanus Expressway, which is elevated. So you just hear a constant stream of cars uh, going and going and going and going. Did if you, you ever... open your window, that's all you could hear. You, you know, uh, did you um, get used to that noise? No, because we only lived there for like a year, a year and a half. Before okay. that, we were in uh, a nicer, we were in like a nicer little neighborhood not far from there. It's in South Brooklyn. It's called Bay Ridge. Um, and it was a more residential street. We also lived right next to that same uh, expressway. But in this part, it was like in a ditch kind of dug into the ground with trees coming up on the sides. Mm -hmm. so that it blocked all the noise. You couldn't hear a car on that thing. Nice. So it was a little bit more peaceful there. Um, but then like to live, you know, where it's, a, where it's a little bit more reasonable with the rents, you're commuting in like an incredible amount on the subways for, at least for the jobs I had. So the jobs I had, I was like a, a teaching artist. I would go to these different high schools and middle schools and do these different art programs. And so, you know, I was going all over the city and just on the train constantly. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, everything came to a stop in 2019. Uh, and I, I, I was able to, like, realize that I was going at an unsustainable kind of pace. And uh, so we decided it was time for a change, slow it down a bit. What was the choice? What, what was the deciding factor for you to move to Philadelphia? It's a good city, man. It's like, so it's like 90 miles from New York City. It takes like an hour and a half on the train mm -hmm. to get there. Um, and it's, 
the economy is way different. It's like a much more uh, lower cost of living. Yeah, and you, you have a mansion now for the same amount that you're paying. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> we don't have a mansion, but we have like more space than we ever had in New York. Oh um, yeah, of course. And it's just like yeah, it's a little bit more open and slower paced and yeah so i like it here um but we came here because we still have like well my wife was still working in new york at the time so mm -hmm. it was she just wanted we, we needed to be somewhere close yeah um so that she could go in, up to her job on occasion so it was just the perfect spot but it is a good city There's always a lot going on People are friendly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is your savings account getting heavier, like bigger now that you're, you're not in New York, or, or is it about the same? Uh, it got a little bit. Uh, it got a little bit bigger, but it's probably going to go down if I don't find a job soon. Because <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, I haven't worked since June. When the school year ended, so I was still uh -huh. working in New York too, but we were doing everything remotely. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I don't know what's going on now. So I'm like kind of trying to figure out some more income streams here. Uh, so it might go back down, <laughs> but it's definitely easier. And yeah, I what just like the I like the uh, calmness. Like I could walk around and not really see people if I wanted to. Well, I, I, I'm spoiled in that regard. I live, I live in like in the center of, 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 of the United States. So I don't really have, mm -hmm. so I don't, so I, I've, I've been in New York and I, I can see how like you just, I just don't want to see a person right now. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like, It's kind of nice to go outside and just like look around and see nothing. You know, yeah. not that I'm not seeing nothing, but like, I'm not seeing activity everywhere, you know? And, um, yeah. I imagine having that that <clears throat> constant energy. Uh, you're you're uh, you are compelled to kind of match that energy to some extent for certain. You are, time. and I notice it in in how I walk. Like I have different paces. Like I have my city pace. Like when I was, if you're in like Manhattan, everything's moving extra quick. And even if I wasn't in a rush, even if I was trying to kill time, I'd start walking like super fast. I slow down a little bit more in Brooklyn or in Queens, uh, but in Philly, I walk at like a at a much slower pace on average. <laughs> so talk about what, talk about income streams. What do you mean by that? What do you what are you looking into? Well, I, you know, because I kind of like when you're like a teaching artist. I guess it's similar to being like an adjunct professor. You never know where okay. you're going to work the next year, so you're always just looking anyway. Mm -hmm. for like new ways to uh I, I do a lot of work with art education so i'm always kind of looking for for things in that area and um what kind of opportunities are in, in philadelphia as far as teaching art right now i don't know because i don't really want to go back into the schools quite okay. yet because they're going to be breeding grounds for new variants that okay. i don't want to get um so I'm looking more into remote things and like online sort of opportunities. Yeah, there, there, there is the there is a, 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 a there is peak opportunities for uh, creating like online one-on-one um, -on -one tutoring. You know, I, I've I've spoken to some artists that do that, mm -hmm. and then some even do like if you're really really if you have a lot of time in your hands. You can even set up your own little website that has like modules that people can kind of go step by step and then you can guide them along the way. It depends on how personal or how, how hands on you want to do it. How much time, you, how much it really boils down to how much free time you have to, to kind of put towards that type of, uh, um, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It stresses me out to think about like, because then you got to find. You're like marketing that to people yeah. and trying to find customers. Um, where if you go with some other organization, they've already done the, that work. They just need someone to come in. And yeah. Sort of, sort of are, there, the are there any organizations? Are there any organizations in uh, Philadelphia right now that you're, you're, eye, you're eyeing? Some museums, but not really even that. 
I'm kind of just keeping it to like online mm -hmm. um, kind of things. Whether it like I'm kind of get trying to get it into adjuncting. I was adjuncting at an online program for a little bit. I didn't love it, but <clears throat> I think it was the particular program and class that I was doing. Mm -hmm. I didn't really love, uh, but I think I want to try. You know, keep trying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what what is your like? What's your teaching philosophy? How do you how do you how do you teach? You know, like what what's what's the the way that you go about it? I mean, it depends what I'm teaching. Drawing, I imagine, like, but like drawing at like a college level or in like a high school. Uh, uh, <laughs> dealer's choice, whatever one you want to choose. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it depends on the point of the class, really, not more than anything. Like, if it's just to teach drawing skills, mm -hmm. then, you know, I think it's fine to just kind of go about it in the way that uh, I guess many art schools go about it, which is like, just keep drawing, like still life, nature, show the different techniques, practice the different techniques. And just kind of plow through it and then do the critiques and all that. I don't really think that that's a bad system. Um, if the purpose is to learn and develop skills yeah. in making art. Um, but like what I was doing <clears throat> was more like based around uh, encouraging students to sort of tell their own stories. And so it wasn't really about finding like them developing art making skills as much as it's like give them a bare minimum kind of like structured way of making art uh, and then having them use that to sort of tell some of their own personal stories. So kind of like you're, you're trying to, to get them set up uh, to create like their own body of work essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, but it would just be a few projects. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but with like teaching, you know, I'm always more on the on the uh, encouraging side. I would say, if you want like something from a philosophy of sorts, you know. So <clears throat> some some, and especially if you go to like an art school or something, you'll get some kind of professor sometimes who's very difficult. Like they're very hard on you, and they're very hard on everybody. It's just kind of their way. Um, they 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 have that kind of mentality of like we have to break you. To make you strong or whatever. Did and you I ever really, one of those? Kind of. No one too crazy, but uh, I never responded well to that. Like, I always responded more to encouragement. Um, you know, I know it's important to it's important to to know that everything you make is not precious. It's important to be able to see like where you're messing up or where you could do better. And I never took it personal. Like, if a drawing teacher, you know, drew on my drawing in the middle of class to show me like what I was doing wrong. Like I was, it's not, it's not even that, as long as you're being constructive and sort of encouraging. So I always try to be that way because that was always what I responded to, you know? Um, and in public schools, you'd be surprised at like how many, like how shattered so many kids are with no self-esteem and no, you know, nothing really positive going on in their life. And how a little bit of like positivity and encouragement goes goes a long way. I guess it's sometimes, a mean world. Sometimes uh, when I teach, I think I I, I um I kind of I kind of go in like in neutral. Not like I'm not dri not like I'm driving neutral, but I, mm -hmm. I I maintain like a neutral position with whether it's good or bad, uh, because I'm more concerned about them, the the, the that person. Um, uh, especially with like design class, I'm more concerned about th that person <clears throat> pursuing the idea. And yeah. sometimes I felt that if I was very, very uh, excited about one of their ideas, that they would be, f they, they would feel like uh, pressured on a subconscious level to do that design. And even though they might think they like the, uh, their, their other like ideas more. And so I yeah. tried my best to be like, impartial with that you know drawing drawing i would uh, um i would merely point out things uh that they need to 
that they need to address like on a technical level. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes I'll, uh, I'll, I'll ask, Hey, can I draw on your drawing to kind of show what I'm saying? Because there's only, there's only so many words I can use to, ex to articulate the idea. It might be easier just to draw on your drawing real quick for a few minutes. So you have an idea what I'm trying to address here, you know? And uh, I think they, that resonated with them. Um, maybe, maybe I should, pick up a little bit more encouragement or maybe I, or maybe uh, uh, my encouragement that I, I did espouse always felt like um, always came off. Like this guy's, this guy's not being serious. He's too, he's too excited about it. He's like, he's, <laughs> he's way, he's, 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 he needs, he's at 11. He needs to dial it back to like where I'm at, which is like a five, a mm -hmm. five excited level. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, but, you know, I'm always when I'm in those areas and I'm seeing people draw and I'm like, man, I just want to draw. I get really I get very energized by seeing other people do things that I want to do. Um, so maybe that was. What was happening there, you know, but, you know, that teaching is also like because it's it's sort of like doing a performance, you know, you got to read the crowd. You got to kind of give them what a little bit of what they want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got to work them over. You got to win them over. Like, so it's just really just do whatever to kind of keep their attention and get them interested in whatever they need to be interested in. Tommy, what do you do to get your students interested in uh, uh, art? What do you do? I don't know, man. I haven't taught an art class since, since the uh, – <laughs> like 2019 when they shut it all down. What I was doing after that, I was working with teachers as like a coach to help mm -hmm. them, uh, help them intertwine like social emotional learning into their, mm -hmm. to their uh, curriculum um, and use art as a way to like make teaching more interesting or learning more interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but again, yeah, it's really like when, when I, it's, it depends on the group of students. Like I would work with, craziest different types of groups of students you know uh, oftentimes no one spoke english so it's like what do you do to win them over it's always different like sometimes you got to show them or get them like what do you do to get them interested in art i mean showing them art helps you know showing them art from that they could relate to helps uh you know we had i was showing like uh i had a bunch of students from guatemala in the class and i was showing them paintings and one day I brought in some Guatemalan painters and uh they were doing some some kind of ceremony thing it was like a uh like a Mayan ceremonial type of thing mm -hmm. and one of the kids was Mayan and she never really said anything in class but she like lit up and started telling us all about what each thing was and why they use it and and all of that so you know it's cool like when people could see like how art could relate to them they get excited about it. That's awesome. And when you make sure that they know it's okay to use art to like tell their story, they're uh, yeah, they're they're gonna they're gonna be more interested in it. You know, what you do? I mean, there's a lot of pressure around art in general, like for people to be super intelligent or super, you know, fancy or whatever you want to call it. That it, it turns people away. It makes them not want to draw. Or not want to do something. What do you mean, like super fancy or super intelligent? I don't know. You ever go to galleries? Uh, oh yeah. And that, you just kind of feel crowd. like everybody's like kind of putting on this show of like uh, sophistication or intelligence sometimes, and then it's almost like no one's able to just let their guard down and be themselves. It happens yeah. to me, and it's not like I'm judging a few people there because I go there, and then it happens to me, and I just kind of get quiet and like look around and get out of there, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Those, those gallery settings that you would go in there and um, everyone, for the most part, uh, people were, were dressed up nicer, you know, and they, and there's wine and cheese and, and it's got that, that air of like, uh, um, like, what would you call it with the, like people of, of, of a higher, like uh, financial class, you know, yeah. you're just, and yeah. you're like, oh, wow, well, I'm, I am not <laughs> in the right area. I should be going, uh, 
out the door somewhere and going back to my studio. <laughs> I don't know. That's how, so yeah, that's how I felt when I went into those gallery spaces, you know? Yeah. Uh, what I wanted to ask is how, uh, um, did you deal with students that, that felt that they made errors or felt that they, that they made mistakes, you know, and then the, and the, the students that really wanted to like improve and they were just seeing all they were doing is seeing everything that's wrong with their drawing that they lose sight of what's good. Oh man, just, you got to downplay the mistakes, you know, it's like when a kid falls and, yeah. and if you panic, they start crying. But if you're like, Oh, you'll, you'll be all right. And then they're like, oh, okay. You know, Mm -hmm. uh they kind of like read you it's it's very similar you know mm -hmm. um kind of frame everything like a learning opportunity but it's hard i mean in, in with high school it's hard because you know you don't know what people are going through so so i've seen breakdowns happen and the papers get ripped up people ran off like person you, and whatever you know you had you had students rip up their paper well yeah 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 i mean you know they just don't know how to deal with it, you know, messing up or whatever. So just kind of freak out, run out, leave. Yeah. Yeah. There's the, um, like there's this, this, this notion of like <clears throat> that if you make a mistake that there's something wrong with you, or if you make a mistake in your drawing, we like, the work that we're creating or the work that the person individual is creating is like a reflection on them of them, you know? Yeah. And, and if they're, if their drawing or artwork is quote unquote flawed or has mistakes, right. Um, by like proxy, that person ha is flawed and they are, yeah, is flawed and they're full of mistakes and they like, they, but they, that's how school works. I mean, yeah. you go in there, you're, tested you're quizzed you're graded you're yeah you know you're you're all this like classified and organized into like this class and that class yeah yeah so you know that's what you expect so it's they Art's intertwine it. it is it it's is com it's completely different they, they like uh I've, I've tried to uh um uh as as you kind of talked about it frame it i tried to frame it around when i was teaching i would try to frame it around my students like listen making mistakes is an opportunity to to see where you if you didn't make a mistake you wouldn't know what you're doing wrong and now that you know what you're doing wrong you can kind of you can course correct um and um and, and don't don't think of it as like oh this piece is garbage i should i should throw it away and i should not even try again you know um, that's, that's a wrong way of, of, of thinking it about it when you're doing artwork, because, you know, artists don't do one piece of work and be like, yeah, this is perfect. I'm done. I've mastered the, I've mastered the skill of all art ever. I don't need to even touch a brush or pencil ever again. I made one piece and it was perfect. I'm out of 5,000, right? <laughs> uh, that never happens. It's more like I've done 5,000 pieces and the last five have been good. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I was thinking about something like that the, uh, the other day or earlier. I can't remember, but it's like when, when an artist gets to be like a really big name, what happens? Because <clears throat> I, I mean, I wonder like what happens to their studio practice when it's like, a bigger uh, chance to take a risk, you know? There's a lot more writing on any risks you take in the studio. Yeah, yeah. But then also there's from the other side, people do that sort of like in in in, in art or music or whatever, there's like this hero worship. So once you like elevate someone to this like high status, you're not giving them a chance to make some, you know, bad work, which means you're not giving them a chance to really like explore explore and, and yeah. do something totally new and different it's kind of like a tricky place to be in i imagine yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of artists <clears throat> out there that um hit like the jackpot that every piece that they sell once they get that formula every piece that they sell afterward uh is every every piece that they make sells afterward yeah you know because they've hit that that formula of aesthetic that and that that marketplace 
of people that were, are just willing to buy that work, you mm -hmm. know? But the problem is that once that kind of happens, a lot of them won't, don't, don't do anything differently for their entire career. Or if they do, it's very, very slow and you won't even notice it because it's um, it, it, like it, it, it looks the same thing. It's like the same thing they've done 10 years ago, but maybe a little bit different, you know? Uh, do you think I've, it's the same with music or are we a little more uh, like with musicians being like, oh, this new album's no good, you know? Try again. Yeah, I, I think I think um, when the those musicians uh, they make it big, yeah, uh, they can uh, uh, like with the label if they make it big with big with the label, they can have a few stinking uh, stinkers of out like albums that are stinkers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but they can't keep doing that, or else they won't be in the label anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember, I remember as a kid, I'd, I'd have. I'd uh I'd have uh, uh friends talk they talk about oh here have you listened to this new album from the, from so and so artists I'm like I haven't yet and they're like don't it sucks and I was like it's it's like not even it's not like what they did before you know and right. once they make it when they make it it's like you the people that uh the people that are their their fan base they want the same thing over and over again you know J just kind of recycled or reconstituted. And whenever that artist tries to do something a little bit different, tries to do a different thing that it's still this, it's still done in the same voice or same musical like mannerisms, I guess. But like they do something different, uh, but it, it veers off a little bit too far from different from what the 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 fan base is used to. They don't like it, mm. you know. Uh, I think though, there's a group of people that, um. Are gonna that that follow artists or musicians, and will like whatever they do, uh, even if it's not the same type of stuff that they're doing that they that they used to be doing. Uh, I think because um, they like that person or that artist or music, uh, band as a as like an individual or or a, a, like as a whole, as opposed to what they always create because. Um, Especially more, especially today, today where you can have, um, you know, a, a closer connection to people that you to to your customers, you mm -hmm. know, your customer base that's online on Instagram or uh, on Facebook or YouTube or whatever or Twitch or whatever platform people are watching you or looking at your work, um, they can connect and contact you. Before there was a barrier of not being able to contact you, you know, like before. They, the, there was the barrier of having to send you an email, you know? And then before that, you had to send a letter. And then you had to wait for that person to send you a letter, right? Yeah. You know? uh, now, um, like, you can, people can DM you on Instagram and you can reply, you know? And that's almost like having a, having their phone number almost, you know, you yeah. like you literally have their phone number because uh, the 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 reply rates on a lot of these. Um, I'm not saying like the the people that have like millions of followers, but the reply rates on like you know smaller like Instagrammer who has a good amount of followers who likes their work and and, and sells to a lot of his uh, uh, people that follow him on on those platforms. You know, he can contact them or she can contact them directly. Try, contact them directly. So, you know, I think it's different than before I, I all i know is that when i was a kid the, the if they changed if the the artist changed what they did you know they would get mad and i and i always thought that was kind of like as an artist as a i was an artist so i also thought like well you can't expect the person to to do the same thing over and over again they're, they're going to change like mm. they're, you know they're going to evolve they're going to uh, their, their their philosophy or their the way that they approach their work is going to change you know their experiences will kind of will kind of guide their 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 work a to some extent. What they're doing, you know, what they're reading, what they're seeing, will guide their work, whatever it is. And uh, it's like um, uh, it's like a lot of people think that artists or musicians want are, are live in a vacuum, like a time capsule almost. And I also, to some extent, like the artists themselves could be that way too. 
Like when they when they get success, they're too they 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 get success selling the same artwork. They're too afraid to to do something new because then if they do something new, um, they might lose that cash flow that they had prior previously. And there's there's some comfort in knowing there's some comfort in knowing that you can make something and it, it's like almost not predetermined, but there's a high probability of it if it's selling to someone. Uh, when yeah. you've got that formula, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't have, I don't have that formula. I'll have, this is observations from what I've seen from other artists and some stories that I heard. I, and I'm just basing it off some, uh, and for people that I've talked, uh, talked with is that they, they've told me stories of the same manner. Like, uh, one person I talked to said that they, they, uh, uh, talked to the, they had an artist who said, I've been painting the same landscape for the past 40 years. You know, it was not like he was painting exact replicas, but like it was, you know, the same like thing mm -hmm. essentially, you know, right. Yeah. That's why yeah. I, I can't do that. I can't do that. I always work in a series. I make a series. I get it out of my system. I move on to something else. Uh, I never could like just be like I'm gonna just keep painting landscapes. How many, I would get bored. How many works do you have to make for you to consider it a series? Good question. I mean, I guess technically, like more than one, right? Yeah. <laughs> but how many? What would what would be a good amount? I, I usually think like twenty. You know, I think good. ten to twenty. Uh, 10 is probably a little bit on the low side. I think a little bit more than that will be like when you go higher up in the 20 range, 20 paintings, I think you're getting mm -hmm. to the point where you've, you've explored that, that idea pretty thoroughly or getting, yeah. get, or at least explored it enough that you can like, you know what? I can, I can keep pursuing this or I want to do something new, you know, or I want to do something yeah. a little bit different, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. But some people would disagree. Some people would say like a hundred or like, you got to do this for years. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I, I never thought about it even that much. I just figured, you know, it's a bunch of work that has a similar theme or is under some umbrella of some yeah. sort. And the la I did a series of eight paintings for a project uh, around last year, not even, I think last January. Um, yeah, and it was, I, I tried to do more. I just ran out of time, so I just did eight. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> And it was a series. Yeah, I mean, in my eyes, yeah. Well, you, if it if it if it fits if it's enough pieces to go in a gallery or or uh, uh, take up an entire room of, of wall space, mm -hmm. I think that could be considered a series. I I don't know, I don't know, mm -hmm. like there because I don't explore that 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 idea either. I don't go around like, huh, how many pieces do you have to make for it to be considered <laughs> a series? That, as you said, more than one. I mean, technically, that's that's there's truth to that you know yeah so um what was your uh what was art like as a child like what'd you make oh man uh i don't you know it's interesting like what i i remember specifically always drawing on everything i could draw on like as much paper as i could get i would draw on it uh, I was always drawing on everything. The earliest thing I remember drawing was a lot of was dinosaurs, which I recently started painting again, some dinosaurs. So you got like a kind of dinosaur back there or a Godzilla. Yeah. It's a toy. <laughs> no, it's a dinosaur. Okay, the so there you go. I remember I love drawing dinosaurs, but you know, I would, like what is it that makes people just need to draw or, you know, compulsively like, you're just born with it. That's just who you are. Cause I could never really stop. And I had no, there was no art introduced to me in my life. Like it was just whatever was around like cartoons, some comic books, some graffiti, album art, like album covers. Like that's where I kind of would always get my art fixed growing yeah. up, you know, toys even, um, you know, and then I would just, practice drawing by just copying everything album art the lettering uh, comics cartoons whatever i could you know do the uh to sort of draw like i didn't have a my parents never introduced me to art you know there was no real art in my house mm -hmm. um 
So I would just do it like that. It wasn't in high school. Like I needed a, I needed, I needed a path. And I saw like I could use art because I was not a good student. I was not very smart, uh, but I was good with the art. So I kind of just kept pushing through with that. Kind of got me out of, into a college. Yeah. And what college was that? The Memphis College of Art. How, what was your experience like uh, at Memphis College of Art? It was great. It was uh, totally different than anything I'd ever like been around before. You know, different kinds of people, like like a more positive vibe from people than what I was used to. Mm -hmm. um, and then the teachers were great. You know, the first semester was a little scary. I didn't really know if I could handle it. It felt very intimidating, but uh got the hang of it right away and yeah i like the approach at that school it was like um it was like a lot of like like a boot camp for just learning how to make art you know for like two years you just draw and fill up sketchbooks and paint and colors and you know figure out everything 3d 2d uh <clears throat> so you really learn a lot and you get mm -hmm. like a good sort of discipline and then you start to try to figure out how to make, you know, some work, some like interesting work in your own voice, I guess. Did you do a lot of a lot of sketchbook work at Memphis College of Art? Yeah, they were crazy with it. It was like a school wide like obsession with filling up sketchbooks for every class by the end of the semester. Did they want you to fill up one one sketchbook per class? Yeah, yeah. They would even they'd be like put like four reports on artists and do like 10, uh, you know, interpretations of famous paintings. And it's just like, holy shit. So you got like <laughs> constantly like working did, in that thing. Did you, did you find some utility out of doing that type of activity in your sketchbook? Yeah, I loved it. It was always like a escape for me, you know, you escape into a sketchbook. Yeah, I find that uh, uh, like sketchbooks are like huge experimental grounds where you can really just like, mess up mess around in and not worry about making mistakes you know yeah like uh, i i would i would look at some of my old sketchbooks and i see like really good drawings next to like absolute garbage and i was like <laughs> are these two people or something because they're like i know how i work they would they would they were probably done the same day or within the, that week so like what happened between that you know <laughs> so like, there's always errors happening uh, uh, in the sketchbook, which was kind of nice to see, actually. And you were, you were uh, at, at Memphis College of Art uh, from when? From nineteen ninety eight to two thousand two, I guess. Mm hmm. Yeah. And then, and then, what'd you do after that? Uh, <clears throat> I went to California, Long Beach, California. And I was gonna do a graduate program there. Yeah. Um, so I was doing it like real slow, like a few credits a semester, because I was like trying to set up and like get a job. I needed to have some money, you know, income coming yeah. in. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I did that for like a year, but then I just kind of focused on working. Um, and I, that's kind of when I got into doing a lot of the teaching artist type of work. Uh, yeah, so I was there for a while and then I was kind of like, you know, I forget, I'll just go back to New York. I went back to New York and just sort of was making art there for a while, a few years, several years. <clears throat> um, yeah. Did, did you it. have a studio space in New York or was it your, uh, the place? Always you wherever I lived. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine a studio space in New York would be like, the same rate as the place that you lived at there's places that'll help you get a uh, studio space that's like subsidized or like a little bit you know more affordable you have to mm -hmm. apply to get in or whatever but they could be pricey yeah they, you know any any real estate is going to be really pricey in new york so but there's ways around it um in the last apartment or the last two apartments i had there was uh, i had a studio like an extra room as a studio. So it was nice. <laughs> What's a typical day like for you? Like, um, 
how do you organize your day so that you can um how do i spend, organize my spend, spend time on your your craft you know yeah because that's uh, one of the challenging things you have to you have to kind of uh, work with as an artist is finding time to work on your art especially yeah. if you're employed i know i know it's uh it's tricky my studio is still in my house it's in it's in the basement of my house now and um that's good and bad because it's good because you can always just come down and do some work and yeah it's bad because you know you could get distracted pretty easily too if, if you go and leave some go to your studio you're kind of there to do something it's like yeah. a job you know um but when it's in your basement like you can just i can just go back upstairs and stop <laughs> working on all right but i try to you know take advantage of like it's convenient so i'm working on a series of drawings right now and i have them just set up <clears throat> so when i come down i can just pick up a pencil sit down and pick up where i left off and uh even if i work for like 20 minutes i got something done but i can also you know uh i can also stay for longer but like in order to make sure i have the time it's more i have to eliminate like other things that i have to do and then i have to eliminate distractions understand so, that completely yeah so it's just a matter of really closing the door and hanging out for a bit and getting, you know, just staying in, around your work and getting into work, listening to things like music and stuff helps me too. Cause I get lost in the music, lose, lose track of time. Yeah. What kind of distractions do you, you normally have to deal with uh, as a working artist? Well, like you said, you gotta always worry about making money. Mm -hmm. And that kind of can be distracting because it could be stressful too, you know, you get anxiety around it. And then it's hard to, it's hard to get in a good headspace for art in those cases. Um, life distractions, laziness, boredom, hunger. <laughs> I, I, I got a solution to all of that. Oh yeah. That will, that will get you in your studio guaranteed to maximize at least to, to create at least two hours of, of art productivity uh -huh. the, the night before tommy what you got to do is go downstairs place a whole pie uh -huh. on your desk yeah make sure it's covered you know so nothing really <laughs> eats it and then and then go upstairs go to bed and then uh and then uh when you wake up you uh and you do all your little your daily things that you have to do and then you say, I got to go downstairs and work. And you do not, you do not stop working until you uh, work for two hours. But also, you have to finish eating that whole pie. See, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> that would never happen. I, uh, you never eat a whole pie? Uh, I would have that once upon a time. But <laughs> because of the uh, end of like working and like, kind of a lot of outdoor things and like going places since 2019 or 2020 i uh uh got like unhealthy you know because i was just kind of sitting around a lot especially when i was still in brooklyn yeah it was like never anywhere to go and then you would just like we would like treat ourselves by making like all kinds of foods and delicious foods and unhealthy foods and so you know Things calmed down. We came here. Things calmed down. I went to the doctor, and the doctor was like, "Yeah, you can't live like that. <laughs> you won't live long like that." So you know, I didn't want to be on medications and things. So I just changed the way I ate, and lived, and uh, got back to normal. So now I'm fine. Took like a few months, but I don't want to go back to eating. I know, like I, I enjoy this. Could it? I enjoy. Could it be, could it be a, a a very lean? chicken pot pie yeah i love a chicken pot pie i would totally eat pie i'm not saying i wouldn't i just wouldn't <laughs> eat a whole pie it's oh insane <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh. Um, but yeah it's good like kind of went mostly vegetarian i'm into it how uh so you're 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 vegan no no i just went went mostly vegetarian okay. just very, like eating a lot less meat okay um okay 
less processed yeah. food. Yeah, I was never big on processed food though. I mean, I was, I guess, when I was like a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, never so, that much. My parents always had a garden and stuff, you know. Well, that helps. That definitely yeah. helps. Do, so, um, do you have a set schedule like that you work from? Do you have a planner or something that you you like plan out your day so you know exactly when you're going to be in the studio, or is it like, okay? Uh, uh, people are not in the house right now. I'm going downstairs <laughs> and get, I want to get cracking. Uh, it depends. Like if there's a deadline for sure, I'll have um, like a strict schedule. Um, if there's no deadline, then it depends on how busy I am. If I'm really busy, I'll schedule time to make sure I'm there in the studio. Yeah. Uh, but when I'm not particularly busy with other things, uh, I don't. And I probably should. I don't because I just kind of meander down into the studio and do some work, and, you know, but I probably should. <laughs> if there's no deadline and there's not like, and I have a lot of free time, I don't use it that wisely, I guess. Yeah. I, I, I often feel really guilty if I, if I don't use my time, if I, if I squander my time, I think it's because I, I, I've spent so much time wasting it on, on video games. I feel mm -hmm. like, I feel like, <clears throat> Like after after playing video games for so long, I'm like, man, I've been doing this for a long time, and uh, I'm not really that good at it. Uh, I don't. Like, it's every game is almost the same to me after doing so many. Like they're just graphically better, but like, yeah, uh, and to its core, there's not much difference <laughs> in a game like in a first person shooter from another first person shooter. The storyline's different. The skins are different. And it's, but basically, when you break down all the nuts and bolts of it, right, it's just like this. It's a first-person shooter, right? Yeah. And so, like after doing that for so long, I, I said, you know what? Oh man, I gotta, I gotta get the drawing. I gotta do something uh, to make myself feel a little bit. I think it, uh, it gives myself a, a sense of like pride or like joy being able to, mm -hmm. to have like a piece being created. That way, I, I feel like something is is has has been something good has been done do you ever get that type of feeling after uh making a work yeah i mean finishing something especially if you like it it's a great feeling you know um it's a better feeling than starting something <laughs> the starting part's hard too often and the worst feeling is abandoning something you know and especially if you don't want to abandon it like you just did that's the worst. But yeah, finishing something is good. I don't I don't think video games are necessarily a waste of time. Um I don't think wasting time is a waste of time. Though really, because you it depends what you do with you know uh the uh the byproduct of that time. Yeah. So there's a uh I'll tell you a couple of stories, but there's one there's a man in Brooklyn who has a hamburger place with lots of video games uh, that you could play mm -hmm. from like the classic Nintendo all the way to the whatever's out now. If you beat him in Halo, he'll give you free ice cream. If you're any good <laughs> at Halo. <laughs> my brother the, and I, my brother, his friend and I all tried to gang up on him in Halo and he just destroyed all of us. No one oh, got ice cream. Man, <laughs> man, he must be really good at Halo. Yeah, no, he was, it was ridiculous. Um, but I, I was playing a game. I still play it. It's like a battle royale game where you just sort of jump down on a map and try to kill everybody else. Mm. Like uh, PUBG or Fortnite. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I ended up, when I first started playing it, see, it was really hard because I wasn't used to it. And I, I uh, didn't think I would beat it. I was playing just solo and I beat uh, a round or came in first, you know, I survived to the end. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up turning it into like a story on the subway one day because I was thinking about it. I just played and then I was going to work. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, uh, uh, thinking about all the little things that happened. And I turned it into a story, like a sort of a, of a war story. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that ended up turning that into like a whole series of drawings that I'm doing about animals that... Um, do sort of these 
do things that we would consider as humans to be like immoral or moral, like morally good or morally bad kind of behaviors. So it like falls in that spectrum, but it happens within the animal kingdom, within like a species within itself, like uh, hyenas or penguins or whatever, you know. Is that typically how you start some of your, your artwork? No, it's, it's just a random, like it just happened, you know. And it happened from, because I was like spent half my day playing a video game before I went to work. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the subway ride there, I turned it into like a story. I didn't know what I was going to do with this story, but it got me to thinking about how like almost all people around the world will agree that killing another person's bad or wrong, but we always justify it anyway with wars or with this or with that, you know, yeah. death penalties and this and that. So I just thought it was interesting how we compromise our own morality all the time, you know? Um, and then I just thought about, I was thinking about, cause I work with a lot of, most of my works about nature and our connection to, to, to the natural world uh, or to the world at large, I guess, beyond just like the human made world. Um, so I just started thinking, how does that like relate to other animals? Cause other animals do shit, you know, like, uh, like cats will eat one of their kittens if it's weak or if it needs food or something to feed the other kittens to keep it alive. Um, so I have all these drawings that kind of start to look at that. It kind of came out of a video game. <laughs> well, the only reason why I, I, I uh, say I, I don't play video games anymore is because like they, they would, um, they would, this is a, a very bad thing. They shouldn't have this, but they do is you can let go in your history and look how long you've played that game. Oh yeah. And then and you it, see like way it, too it, long. Yeah. And it shows you, and uh, I remember I would play play with people online, and they would say like, "Oh man, I I don't even want to look how many days I played." Yeah. And so like yeah. they're 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 literally they're, the amount of time that they played that game is in the months. Like, yeah, like yeah. like hour wise and day wise, they've they've it's tallied up. Oh, like I played this game for three months, ten days, five <laughs> hours, and twenty eight minutes and counting. You know, no, I hear you. That's why I don't have, I don't ever buy consoles. I just don't because I got, you know, the temptation. Like, I've just been playing games on <clears throat> on an iPad. That's why I yeah. play my little shooter games. Um, and then if I, like, go to my brother's house, something, I'll play some games on his console. <laughs> some yeah. Mortal Kombat or something. But, yeah, because you could. You get lost in it. And then there's games like Zelda and stuff. Like, they just go on. You can just play them for too long. They, they go on. And and, new, and the games out there now is they, they are created to, like, literally never end. They're always... Yeah, they don't like, end. They, they're making new, new, <laughs> new content to them and adding new yeah. upgrades and updates. And as long as people keep, keep buying downloadable content, they're going to keep creating... A better version what was it like world of warcraft has been going on for like 20 years now or something yeah, <laughs> yeah. if i like, ever need to just completely withdraw from society that's probably how i'll do it just buy like world. <laughs> but other than yeah you know, yeah it could definitely consume you that's why i don't really i keep it very limited to like i feel like a couple of games that i like to yeah. play um so finish up finish that sentence Oh, and then I, the, this one game I play is, is great because there's no real story or point. Okay. It's just jump in, kill as many people as you can, jump and the game's out. over. Yeah. Done. Done. <laughs> you don't have to, like, complete missions and do anything crazy. So there's and so it's... no commitment. You either play or you don't. I Very could do that. I could balance that into my life. Of course. So uh, um, we, I, I was trying <clears> to uh, get, uh, like, segue into something. Um, mm. so I asked about like, is that how you normally start your artwork? Um, or how are you kind of the process of your artwork, uh, where you play a, bit, a little bit of video games and all of a sudden you're, it, you're just, you, you start thinking about these things, but, uh, how do you start some of your artwork? What, what, what's the process? Do you, do you journal? Do you sketchbook? Do you draw in your sketchbook or you like write down notes or are you just thinking about them for uh, so long that you decide that you're just going to, uh, <laughs> jump into the idea? What, what's, what's. How does it go? I mean, each project really is born in a different way. Like, I don't okay. have a system. So, like, I just told you the one about the drawings that came from, the, like, playing a game and then writing a story. Uh, I did another series where I started with just writing a story, like a, like a short fiction. 
yeah. and then just use that to contextualize a series of paintings. Um, while I was doing the animal drawings, well, I'm still doing them, I mm -hmm. kind of got tired of having to research so many animal behaviors um, that I uh, started doing these dinosaur paintings that I have behind me here. Um, and they, they, this just came from like, we were looking to buy a house. So I was looking at a lot of houses. Yeah. And then uh, we were, I was thinking about dinosaurs because they're interesting to me. They're associated with like end of times, like extinctions. Yeah. But they're also associated with just like childhood wonder, you know? Of course. My kids love dinosaurs, you know? And then we just stop like caring, I guess, about dinosaurs, which is kind of sad. You know, we, we stop like talking about it. I mean, when you're a kid, you talk about dinosaurs regularly. At least They're I do. So cool. Like, and, yeah. and you're, you're right. You like, you like, you like lose interest. It's like a thing that you, you like you, you age out or your yeah. people, your, your, your band of friends say, we don't talk about dinosaurs anymore. It's all about <laughs> Fortnite now. Like, or what it is. But they're still amazing. Like if you go, I went to the Museum of Natural History uh, and they have this dinosaur. His neck just goes like from one room to through a hallway into another room. Like it just never ends. Wow. The size of this thing is crazy. Anyway, so I started just mixing these dinosaurs in with sort of like place homes in places that I've lived before. <laughs> I try to match the dinosaur with the place. Uh <laughs> And, and I don't really even, like, there was no, like, like, big idea behind it. It's just sort of a whim, you know? Like, I'll just follow this. I had that little idea. Do some houses, do some dinosaurs, and uh, followed that whim. So sometimes I just get, like, one little thing to hold on to and see where it takes you. See where it I takes me. I, I like artwork that is based on, uh, uh, more on, like on a whim you know where, yeah where, where you do it as like a lark and then you like you find that you enjoy it more because <laughs> it's like there's less there's less uh Im not not to say there's less importance but like there's it's it's not as as put on a pedestal as like the an idea that you you may have been focusing or working on for a while and you're like making it like i want this thing to be it's got to be it's got to meet an expectation you know, and if you don't meet that expectation, you've the pieces, the work or series has failed. You know, so I enjoy the the ones that you kind of like. You know what? I'm just gonna do this and see what happens, because there's there's no pressure uh, on the outcome, and there's something to be said about having work that you have like no pressure on your shoulders. I think some of the work actually is better. It turns out better that way. Yeah, yeah. I, when I first graduated from uh from college from my undergraduate program i had was like crippled with uh, like anxiety about subject matter and like just ideas and, yeah. and concepts and all of this and like and like how oh, it has to be smart and this has to be all of this has to, you know has to I be think... like big fancy words to talk about it yeah. and it like stressed me out and that kind of crippled me for a while uh until i learned to let go again you know I think I think uh, that's where a lot of colleges and universities kind of uh, uh, where they kind of fail. Mm. Uh, I, 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 I hear you on that where um, th there's this high like imp there, there's this very there's this they 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 uh, st they uh, stress or they put importance on like theme and, and meaning for your like your final your your final series or your 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 bfa show or your mfa show where they like you got to have there's got to be a reason to create that thing you know or else why are you creating it um and i think i, I agree with you on that where it it can kind of cripple you know it can kind of make you question what you're doing especially when you're younger yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah, and you could, it, it made me pretty self-conscious because uh, it makes you feel like you're not intelligent enough to make art. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Uh, the, how, how intelligent you need to be to just like move yeah. some colors around. 
<laughs> well, I mean, there, there's there, there's there's roles to be had in 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 art, right? You you, yeah. you don't ha like there's genres of art in fine art, you know, the genres of fine art. Like you you don't have to make artwork that has a a, a deep meaning. Although a lot of people would would argue against that, um, you know. Uh, but I think the I've always kind of espoused this a lot is like the the just the action is equally as valuable like this doing that thing has importance and if it has importance to you then it might have importance to other people it doesn't have to be oh the dinosaurs were a metaphor for uh uh, uh extinction and this house is going to uh, uh uh degrade and destroy over time and uh so just like the canvas that this piece is on eventually it's going to uh be one with the 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 dinosaurs uh thousands of years from now you know like mm -hmm. or some weird little symbolism that you have uh with your work right um so i'm gonna segue here what kind of special okay. do, you, do you have any special techniques that you use in your art do you do anything special that makes them kind of unique in the execution that you think is different from the norm not that i know i mean no <laughs> I, think I just paint it's just like paintings and drawings uh, do you use anything I specific? Make sculptures. I use acrylic paint and uh, brushes and things. Uh, brushes, and things. <laughs> How about like, uh, do you use any uh, uh, like uh, gel mediums to kind of create a different effects? Not so much anymore. I, I actually been moving away from it because I've okay. been finding it's. I like this sort of flat matte finish on acrylics. Um, and I know there's a. You have some matte medium that i use sometimes but i used to have a gloss one too but i kind of got rid of that uh, i like the the the, the matte look lately or does it, yeah, it doesn't have a, like a shine to it yeah it shines what kind of advice can you give to other artists <laughs> other artists who like there's a lot of artists who should be giving me advice um, uh, advice to like, just kind of, you can go from general to very specific. Yeah. You can go from, uh, 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 um, like the business, business part of it, or just like the <clears throat> more well, of a, a personal, uh, personal I'm, I'm nobody uh, to give business part. advice. <laughs> like you don't want to take business advice from me. Uh, so I'll just say. For advice for like art, I'd say just yeah, don't don't be afraid to sort of talk in your own voice, your own language, because mm -hmm. uh, that'll be that'll make the best work, you know. Um, it's kind of like when writers say, "Write what you know." Mm -hmm. it's, it's very similar, you know. Just do what feels right. Trust your intuition. Trust your instinct. Tommy, do you have a? Um... A, a a dream project that you would you would love to do in the future like imagine if you had unlimited resources and the sky's the limit and you could do anything with your art what would that be man unlimited resources if i had unlimited, Un unlimited resources, time too i don't know that it would be an art thing and i would want to like i would want to to do some sort of urban urban planning <laughs> i would like to do i would like to design a city or like redesign a city uh to have more of a uh, to have more of like a forest intertwined into it yeah just stuff like that would be fun to me but i, I don't even know how to do any of that or like anything about it it just seems really exciting could could you find like a, a place that uh to like design parks would that be something close to along those lines yeah the parks i mean i would want it to just sort of go through the whole city you know kind of be a part of it all or a I playground that, yeah not a playground <laughs> okay. I, don't, I don't care about playground <laughs> i mean like like forests and nature that is is sort of intertwined into the city i wouldn't mind just designing like a building or something Something way out of my wheelhouse, you know. What would you have to do? You, do you have any idea what would you have to do to to get in that position? 
like to facilitate something like that? Uh, I don't know. Be a billionaire, buy a town, and just build it the way you want it. Be a billionaire, buy a town. So that's <laughs> what you need to put on your your, um, your uh, vision board, right? Yeah. Write that up, get a big old piece of paper, write, be a billionaire, buy a town, and then, you know, write goals to achieve. <laughs> uh, you'd, you'd have to, uh, uh, step one, make a, 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 a website that sells books and uh, call it Blamazon. <laughs> and everything else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and everything else. Like stupid Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how do you feel that your work is relevant today? Well, most of my work is about, uh, the way, like our, our relationship to nature, to the natural world, to, and to these things. Cause you know, we are a strange species in that like no other species is building structures and cities to scale that we are. And no other species has changed the climate of, you know, uh, like we have. So we're definitely unique in that way, but we're also connected to everything else. We're born from the same place, right? All the bugs and all the other critters. Yeah. Um, so it kind of, it's just explores that not in any scientific way. I'm not a scientist, but, uh, just sort of ideas around that. Um, and why is that relevant today? Well, you know, from new Orleans to New York is uh, like flooded from a single storm. And uh, yeah. the West is on fire. I don't know how things are where you are, but you might be next in line for a <laughs> natural disaster. I it am seems gonna, like we're all getting it regularly now. I'm going to have a positive outlook and hope that will help. Yeah, you might get a year off. <laughs> like we had a year off last year. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's getting bad. And, like, all the new reports are just that it's getting worse and worse and there's dead zones in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and I know the news is never like telling you anything good. So you gotta, gotta seek out the good news on your own. Yeah, you gotta um, find it. It's, it's really, yeah. it's, like, it's hidden. It is hidden. And uh, I was, yeah, I was reading about a um, bunch of countries, like 30 something countries in Africa are getting together to build a green wall to stop the spread of the Sahara Desert and protect the remaining rainforest. So they're planting like billions of trees from the West Coast to the East Coast of Africa. Oh, wow. Which is a huge, I don't know how many miles, but imagine it's, it's a lot of them. So they're doing like a Johnny Appleseed. Pretty much. Just just eating the apples and throwing trees. seeds behind yeah. them. So, you know, I, I think people are, pretty, are amazing enough to where we'll maybe push it to the limit and then reverse course and do like some crazy stuff and really smart people will come up with something to trap co2 or whatever it is carbon yeah there's a lot uh, of cool stuff that's happening that uh, yeah i think could help uh make the earth more greener like there was a um th they're um this is something that's really cool they're trying and i really am, am for it uh the, I ha like I don't know why people make product like I don't know why we make products that don't really biodegrade at all. I don't either. Yeah. Like, like, and then if you want scenario. like biodegradable garbage bags are yeah. always like three times more money than just the regular garbage bags. So yeah. no one yeah. buys them. Yeah, and then so like uh um so like foam. So what 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 what's happening right now is there's some companies out there that are making they're making like foam uh containers and foam insulation. Uh, that is made out of fungus, like oh, mushroom nice. fungus. So, like yeah. they they're they're able to to make shipping materials out, out of this fungus, and then it gets thrown away and it breaks down. You know, <laughs> yeah, um, that's great. You know, I also like. Uh, I I don't know why it took so long to do this, but uh, I've been starting to see those like straws made out of uh, paper and and wax. Mm -hmm. Have you seen those? Yeah, paper straws. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, uh, I was like, why did it take so long for that to be a thing? You well, know? people made a big stink about it. They don't like their paper straws 
became another freedom issue or something. Oh, the paper straws, the, the paper straws, um, they, they were, uh, they're like, um, they get soggy after a while. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're not, they're not American enough. I use a, <laughs> I use a metal American. straw. <laughs> <laughs> I use a metal straw. I, the paper straws are kind of annoying. Um, well, they're, they're good for fine. Uh, they're fine. I use them. I don't complain. But yeah, yeah, like if you have a drink for a long time, it will get fall apart on you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Tommy, I just want to Yo. say thank you so much. Um, thank you, man. For, nice for uh, you. taking time out of your day to talk to me. I have one last question. Yeah, and let's then, answer uh, it. Yeah. Like, I just want to know, why did you say yes to this interview? Well, I like talking about art. So uh, I watched some of your interviews before I said yes. All right. uh, <laughs> and I thought, okay, that looks like fun. Let's do it. All right. Great. So why not? I mean, we are kind of, I know it's sort of like taboo to talk about for some people, but we are in this sort of business of marketing ourselves too, you know, so why, why not? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, Tommy, where can people find you? All right. You can find me on the internets. Uh, tmavra.com is my website. I'm also Tommy Mavra on Instagram. Uh, I'm Tommy Mavra on Facebook. If you want to, if you want to go through Facebook, but uh, I'm on Instagram more. I don't really use the Facebook too much. And then I'm on, yeah, I'm, I just got my website. If you want to look at some of my work, I have my finished series up there. I also have some stuff that I'm working on that's not quite finished yet. Um, that's the best. Those are two good spots to find me. Uh, for those that uh, want to, oh, that are on YouTube, the those locations, those uh, websites are on in the description section, so you can oh, check yeah. the, his work out there if you'd like. So thank you so much, Tommy. Tommy, thank I really you, do appreciate it, and appreciate you. Uh, appreciate everyone that watched. I hope you have a wonderful day, Tommy. You have a wonderful day. Thank you. And I'll catch you, you right after this. Okay. Okay. Take care, everyone. Pearson out. Bye. Bye.